Hello, Internet. Welcome to episode 45 of the Stanford MLSA seminar series. Uh, today, my name is Dan. As always, today we have with us Piero, Fyodor, and our guests uh, today, Bahran uh, Mirza Soliman from uh, UCLA and previously from Stanford. Um, so today, Bahran is going to be talking um, about data efficient, robust learning for massive data sets for machine learning. So, you know, very relevant to the uh, MLSIS seminar, to the MLSIS topic. Um, a little bit about Baharan. She's now an assistant professor in computer science at UCLA. Uh, she works on developing new methods for efficient machine learning from massive data sets. Um, before we get started, so remember, subscribe to the channel, like the video. If you're watching on YouTube, leave a comment with your favorite moment. Um, what else do people say? You know, click the bell icon um, to be notified. Uh, if you're in the YouTube chat, uh, as always, feel free to ask questions um, and we'll get them across to Baharan um, during the Q&A session. Um, for our students in class, you know, feel free to ask questions as well. Um, and with that, Baharan, uh, take it away. Thank you so much, Dan, for the introduction. Uh, it's great to be here. Hi, everybody. So I'm going to talk about data efficient and robust machine learning from massive data sets in particular by selecting core sets of examples. And what I'm going to talk about are two works jointly with Heidi Kao, Jeff Films, and Yura Leskovic. So from Stanford and the University of Washington. Okay. So I have a little bit of. Okay. So as you all know, machine learning becomes mainstream in lots of uh, new and exciting applications. Let me show you some of my favorites. So for example, in personalized medicine, we want to tailor medical treatments to our different groups of patients based on their medical history. In robotics, we want the robots to be able to kind of grab the stuff and take care of different kind of tasks without the need for human intervention. So in finance, we are receiving thousands of transactions every second, and we want our machine learning algorithms to be able to independently decide and about financial or trading decisions, make those kind of decisions. And finally, autonomous cars, we want the cars to learn how to drive into actual streets among actual cars and humans and signs and navigate themselves without the need for humans kind of to kind of navigate them. So in all these applications, so if you notice, like we need lots of data. And data is actually fuel for all of these machine learning tasks, and in particular, the model ones. So if you let me show you an example from object detection, this is a plot from Google AI. On the x-axis, you, you see the number of examples. As we increase the number of examples from 10 million all the way up to 300 million, so x-axis in a larger scale, we get on the y-axis like a logarithmic increase uh, in the performance of this object detection task. It clearly shows the importance of data for the performance of our machine learning algorithm. But there are uh, a few issues with training on very large data sets. The first one, as you may all know, is that training on large data sets could be very expensive. So let me show you an example. This is kind of an example of training GPT-3 and 45 terabytes of data. So if I kind of Google these numbers correctly, we spent uh, $12 million to train this model. It took more than a month on 124 uh, A100 GPUs. It spent like more than 17 times the yearly energy consumption of an uh, average American. And finally, the amount of CO2 and carbon footprint that we produce by training this model on this big data is twice uh the distance if we drive a car twice the distance between earth and the moon so these numbers are huge right the other example is that in large real data sets usually what we care about is often underrepresented let's think of a self-driving data majority of these data points in this data set belong to these large classes of cars pedestrians and signs and only a few examples in this data set belong to this most important class of accidents and crashes. And this is the class that we actually care about the most, right? And this is really underrepresented. 
So if we go and train a model, train a big model on the entire data and treat all these examples equally, we are going to miss this most important class of accidents and crashes. So the other issue is that usually talking about large real data sets, these data sets are unlabeled. So we use either crowdsourcing or we use automatic labeling, we use another model to kind of get the labels for this new data set that we, got, we have collected. And as a result, we have a lot of mislabeled data points in these massive data sets. So, and what happens is that when we are going to train a model, uh, in particular, think about a deep network that has a very large capacity. So we are going to overfit and learn all these mislabeled data points and noisy data points. So the question is that, can we extract a subset of these massive data sets that allows us to both efficiently and robustly train and learn from this massive data set? Can we find the good examples in a way that we can train our machine learning models only on these good examples and be able to train the same model much more efficiently and robustly? So this is the question that I want to talk about today. So in particular, I want to talk about, like my talk is, has two different parts. The first part, I want to talk about the efficient efficiency. How can we find this most essential data points for efficient machine learning. I want to talk about uh, the first ma efficient machine learning method with rigorous guarantees. And I want to show you how it can allow, like how it can enable us speed up training machine learning models by up to 10 times. And then I want to talk about how we can achieve robustness against noisy labels by again being selective and select a subset of data points. And I want to show you how this method uh, talk, I, I'm going to talk about the method and I'm going to show you how it can guarantee robustness against noise and how it can achieve the state of the art performance in presence of 80% noisy labels. And interestingly, I want to show you that the same subset of examples can provide both efficiency and robustness against noisy labels. Okay, let's start with the first part efficiency. So we are training like modern machine learning models on lots of data points, on tons of data points. But do we actually need all these data points to get a good performing model? Could we somehow smartly select a subset of this data, this massive data sets, and train the same machine learning model and can get the same model trained, but much faster? So the key insight that this might be possible is that like thinking about large data sets and large massive data volumes, as the amount of data increases, the non-redundant information content in this massive data doesn't linearly increase with the size of the data. There is a diminishing return. So the question is, can we find this information volume, the non-redundant part of the data volume, can we find this efficiently and can we only train on this and learn from this information volume or Let's do some data analytics there only on the information volume. So is there any way we can achieve this? So let's restrict ourselves to training a machine learning model. Let's start with the formulation. So training machine learning models often reduce to minimizing regularized empirical risk function. So we have a training data, we have feature vectors and we have labels. And there is a loss function associated with each of these examples, fi. And then the actual loss function is the sum of all these FIs plus a regularizer. And we want to find uh, the best value for W, W star that minimizes this general loss function for us. So examples of this, if we have convex loss functions, we have linear, logistic, and ridge regression. We have regularized support vector machines. And for non-convex functions, the most famous examples are neural networks. So, how do we train these models? How do we actually minimize this loss function? We often apply some kind of incremental gradient method like SGD, SGD with momentum. But like the idea behind all these methods, because the data set is large, we cannot afford to do gradient descent. We do incremental gradient descent. And the idea is that we take examples one by one and we sequentially step along the negative um, gradient right direction. 
So in particular for stochastic gradient methods, because the gradient for every example is an unbiased estimate of the full gradient, sum of gradients of all the data points. So this gradient estimate has a very large variance. And as a result, SGD in particular is those stochastic type of gradient methods in particular are slow to converge. So we will get to the minimum eventually, but it may take a while. So the question is that, can we find the most essential and the most important set of examples and only train on them, only minimize this loss function on these examples and can train these models much faster? So just to make sure the problem is clear, let's imagine that we want to select a subset. We need a utility function. This is a subset selection problem. We need a utility function f. We want to maximize. We want to find a subset that maximizes this utility function. And the objective is that assume that we have this large image data set. We want to select a subset of these images in a way that if we train a machine learning model on the entire data and only on the subset we get, we get the same model. If we can do this, then we get a speed up, which is equal to the size of the entire data over the size of the subset, because we are only training on this subset at every epoch. So the question becomes, what should be this utility function f that we maximize it and we find this good set of examples? OK, so this is a challenging problem if you think about it. Because first of all, it's not clear what should be these examples. So shall we select points that are close to the decision boundary or shall we select points that give us a good idea of how the data is distributed, right? So where should be these examples? What are these most important examples? Secondly, we want to be able to kind of find these examples very quickly because otherwise if it takes a lot of time to find these examples and then we want to train on them, we don't get any speed up. So we need to decide how much to move based on which point, the type size in the uh, gradient methods that we use. And very importantly, we want to be able to guarantee something about the performance of this model trained on these subsets that we find. We want to kind of make sure that this is a good subset, this is a representative subset for training this machine learning model. Um, we don't want something heuristic that may work now and may not work on the other bits. So uh, let's, let, let's think about how, what should be this subset. So let's go back to the problem formulation. We have a loss function. We want to minimize this loss. We want to find a minimizer W star. That would be the parameter of the train model. So now, and as I mentioned, we usually apply some kind of a gradient method, some kind of a stochastic gradient descent. And if you actually think of what is what we actually need to minimize this function for this incremental gradient method, what do we actually what do we need? It's the gradients, right? So if we need the, if we have the gradients, like if we can find a subset that has a similar gradient to the gradient of all the data points, then we can apply almost any type of incremental gradient method only to this subset, and we can ensure that. If we minimize this loss function only on this subset, we converge to the same or similar W star, right? So this is the idea that we had. So we said that let's find the subset in a way that the difference between the gradient of the subset and this subset could be weighted. Let's call it S. Let's uh, make sure that the difference between the weighted gradient of the element in this subset and the full gradient, sum of gradient of all the data points, this difference is upper bounded by some error epsilon. And now, like thinking about this formulation without showing you the mathematical steps, I want to show you what is the solution. Like what, what is the subset that satisfies this property has a similar gradient to the gradient of all the data points. And the answer is that those elements are the methods of all the data points in the gradient space, what does this mean? So imagine that we have our data set, we have this data set V, we are doing some stochastic method, gradient method, and we are at particular W, like this parameter W. We calculate the gradient of this data set, we transfer the data points from the feature space to the gradient space. If we look at all the gradients instead of the 
original feature vectors. And if we find the most central elements, the cluster centers, kind of, this is going to be the elements that have a very similar gradient to the sum of gradients of all the data points. So this is going to be that subset that you are looking for. And now the question is that how can we actually find these methods? And we want to find them quickly from large data sets. And the answer is that fortunately, this objective function, if that if we solve this problem, we find this, like these are the formulation for the most central elements in the data. This is the k method problem. k method problem is submodular. What does that mean? So submodularity modularity means diminishing returns property. If you add an element to a smaller subset, the benefit would be larger than if you add the same element to a larger subset. So an exemplar-based clustering or exemplar clustering has this diminishing returns property. The more you select and add elements to your subset, you will get less and less benefit. So now that we have a submodular function, this is great because now we can use a simple greedy algorithm to find those most central elements, to find the medoids or exemplars from the gradient space. So we can solve this very efficiently. We can use distributed algorithms, we can use streaming algorithms, or we can use centralized algorithms if the data is not very large, but we can find these examples efficiently. This is very fast. So there is a small issue here. If you remember, I said, let's imagine that we are at this particular parameter W. So if we want to update this subset, find a new subset after every SUD update, this is going to be very slow. Right? No matter how fast is this greedy algorithm, we don't want to kind of do this after every single SUD update. This is going to be very slow. So what can we do? So let's look at this objective function, this exemplar clustering objective function. Let's take it to the next slide. So this is the W dependent part of our problem. So what we thought we can do is that we can, like the, this is the, you can see the norm, uh, the pairwise distances between gradients of I and J, right? So can we find a worst case difference between gradients and I, I and J all over the parameter space, all over W? So if we can do that, we can upper bound this objective function by the term in the right, which is the maximum worst case difference between the gradient of i and j for all the w's. And now if we solve this problem, if we solve this problem like by making it to be less than epsilon, then we can find one subset which is good during the training, no matter where we are in terms of the parameters. So this upper bound, we call it wij. This is the worst case difference between gradients of, uh, of I and J all over the parameter space. And in the next slide, I want to show you how we can calculate this. But now if we can do this, then we can, we are good with one subset during the training. So if you have a convex function, like if you are solving a regression problem or an SVM problem or a classical machine learning problem, basically, we can show that this dij, the worst case difference between gradients and i and j, this can be upper bounded by a constant times the difference between feature vectors. And feature vectors wouldn't change, right? So this dij's, we can bound at the very beginning before we start any training. We don't need to calculate any gradient. So in the beginning, before we start the training, we look at our feature vectors, we find the exemplars using the greedy algorithm, submodular optimization, based on the feature vectors. And this would be the pre-processing step, one shot, very fast. We find this subset, we are good to train on it for as many epochs as we want, right? So this is great. How about neural network? How about non-convex functions? So here we don't have such a nice upper bound for DIJ, but what we can do is that we can use this result from 2019 that is, saying that kind of the gradient of the loss with respect to all the parameters, you can approximate it by the gradient of the loss with respect to only input to the last layer. And to get this, like if you have a softmax cross entropy or something in there, like you have a classification task, you can get this upper bounds on DIJ using this argument using one forward pass. 
So you do one forward pass, you don't need to do any backward pass. You don't need to calculate any exact gradient because that is the expensive part. So we approximate the gradients using one forward pass. We find the central elements from this approximate gradient space. So of course, this is a still W dependent. We have to update the subset every now and then during the training, but at least we can do it fast. Okay, so this is going to be the final approach. So we use the greedy algorithm to find this subset of examples from the gradient space or the approximate gradient space. We weight each of these examples by the size of its corresponding cluster. Each of these examples, remember, are one cluster centers, uh, one cluster center in the gradient space. So the size of that cluster, we would weight every example with. And now we apply our, our favorite incremental gradient method, for example, STD, only on the elements on this subset. But if we are processing the center of a larger cluster, then we make a larger move. If we are training based on a center of a smaller cluster, we make a smaller move. So the step size is going to be proportional to the size of the cluster. And if so, at every epoch we do this, we only apply SGD on these elements in this subset. And we can actually prove that this will allow us, this allows us to converge to a very close neighborhood of the optimal, uh, optimal solution. The convergence rate would be the same as the convergence rate of the original algorithm, let's say SGD or incremental gradient method, but you get. K over V over K, V is the size of the entire data, K is the size of the subset the speed up, um, which is really nice. So we get theoretical guarantees for this. So one quick note is that there are already existing techniques to speed up gradient methods, for example, variance deduction techniques, choosing better step sizes uh, and important sampling. But the good thing is that we can apply all these methods to the subsets that I just talked about. So these are orthogonal and can be applied at the same time, which is nice because then you get more speed up. So let me show you some quick experiments. So here I am showing you an example of a logistic regression. This is on a data set with more than 500K data points. We selected 10% of these elements using the method that I just explained. And here you show, you see the training loss and the test accuracy in the bottom for SGD on the left and for SOGA, a variance reduction technique on the right. So the green is training on random subset of size 10. Blue is training on these elements that I just explained and orange is training on the entire data. with SGD and with SOGA. And as you can see, training on these examples found by Craig, this method that I just explained, this is converging much faster and you get the same test accuracy, we got six times speed up in this case. So let's look at an imbalanced data set, which I motivated in the beginning with. So here we have this 50K data points. This is a very imbalanced data set, 90 to 10, I believe. So you see the training loss on the Y axis versus time and the X axis. And this orange point in the bottom left is the time that SGD trained on the entire data converges. So here we are selecting subsets, random subsets of size 10%, 20, 30, all the way up to 90%. And here we are selecting subsets of the same size with our method break. And as you see, after selecting 30% of the points, we can converge to the same optimal solution. And we get seven times the speed up. Let's look at a toy example of neural network training MNIST with a two layer uh, neural network. Uh, and uh, this is the MNIST example, two layer neural network. So you see the test accuracy and training loss, test accuracy on the left, training loss on the right. This is SGD, x axis is the time. This is SGD plus trained on the examples that we find. And this is. Uh, SGD on the random examples, random subsets, and the size is 40 or 50% here. So we got even better generalization performance by training on this subset only. And here we are training ResNet 20 on CPAR 10. So X axis shows the fraction of data that we selected during the entire training cycle. 
So you see every point in this line is a different subset size. Blue is SGD and Craig, green is SGD and random subsets. You see that SG, uh, Craig, our method kind of focuses on the most important examples and it can get the same or better test accuracy by training on less amount of data points. So it's data efficient. So let me also quickly talk about robustness against noisy labels. Now we talk a little bit about data efficient training. Let's switch gears to robustness, straight selecting examples for robust learning. So I want to now start with existing techniques. There are a lot of existing techniques, estimating the noise transition matrix, correcting noisy labels, designing robust noise functions, regularization, derivating examples. So these methods are usually either challenging, they may overfit, Sometimes they do not give us the optimal performance. Some of them require auxiliary models or training clean, a set of clean data points. But the most kind of important limitation of all these methods is that they do not provide any theoretical warranty. For the performance of the model, let's say a deep model now trained on these noisy data points. So again, let's just start with the problem formulation. Let's assume that we have a square loss function, we have a data set D, and some of the labels YI in this data set could be wrong. Could, some of these data points could be mislabeled or noisy, labeled, right? So again, we want to have like gradient descent. So we want to move based on the negative direction of the gradient. But if it decompose the gradient, we see that the gradient can be decomposed into the Jacobian matrix and the residual for this square loss. So what is the Jacobian matrix? It's all the first order partial derivatives of this neural network with respect to all the parameters. And residual is just a difference between function, the neural network prediction and the label, right? So now, uh, we know that like some observations, if you look at some observations about the Jacobian matrix. So Jacobian matrix is a very big Jacobian matrix. All the examples, partial derivative of F with respect to all the elements. So this is going to be very big. But people have observed that this is a low rank matrix. What does it mean? It means that if you look at the distribution of the singular values, you see that there are a number, small number, usually of very large singular values. And the rest of the singular values are very small. So there are a few important directions and the rest of the directions in this matrix are really not important. That, that's not that important. So this subspace associated with this largest singular values, this is called the information space and this is low dimensional because there are not many large singular values. And the rest, Called, is called the noise sensor space. And this is very high dimensional because we have a lot of the small singular values. So, and people have shown that learning happens very fast over the information space in the beginning. And then it takes a while as we train more and more and more, then we start to kind of overfit over this noise sensor space. So learning is slow and prone to overfitting over the noise sensor space. The other two obser in interesting observations is that clean labels often have a good alignment with this low dimensional information space. And noisy labels usually fall on this very high dimensional noise sensor space. So can we use these observations to kind of filter only the clean labels? This is the question. And so if you think about this histogram again, so we know that clean labels fall on this low dimensional space of information space and noisy ones, the clean ones fall on the information space, the noisy ones fall on the noise sensor space. Noise sensor space is very high dimensional. So if something aligns on a very high dimensional space, things get apart from each other. Like in high dimensional space, things are not close to each other, they spread out. But clean data points, they fall on this low dimensional space of large singular values. So the data points that are similar to each other, feature wise, they cluster together. Because in low dimensional space, things are closer to each other and similar things cluster 
together tightly in the information space. But noise will spread out, right? So noisy data spreads out, clean data cluster together. And you remember that alignment of the residual with the Jacobian is the gradient, right? So again, if we class, if we find if we transfer the data set to the gradient space, and if we find the most central element in the gradient space, we can somehow be sure that with a very high probability, these data points are going to be clean. Okay. And we added a small step that we are mixing up each of these centers with one of the other elements in the same cluster as well. This is a small detail. But if you remember, this is exactly the same set of data points that can let us learn efficiently, right? Cluster centers in the gradient space. So we use a similar algorithm. We apply incremental gradient or SGD only to these central elements in the gradient space. And now the good thing is that we can guarantee that if you train a deep network and only these examples, uh, it's guaranteed that even if some of these examples are not clean labeled, then we are going to be able to classify all of them correctly. Okay, let me finish with a few experiments. So here you see on the y-axis, how many elements in these subsets are clean basically that we found. So this is C part 10, the data set is C part 10. We found 50% of this subset of this data set, like subsets of size 50%, we found from C part 10. We only trained on them. And we tried, sorry, we have 50% noise and we tried subsets of size 30%, 50%, and 70%. And as you can see, for the 30%, the green line, we can almost, almost all of them are clean. Like we could find all the clean examples. For the orange line, which is 50%, as training continues, we can, like after Epoch 75, we can almost filter all the clean examples. And for the 70%, because 50% of the data is noisy, of course, we will have more than 20% noise in the 70% data. But the kind of interesting thing is that the gradient, centers of the gradient, they are mostly clean data points. Even if there is a small fraction of noisy labels in these subsets, according to the previous theorem, we can correctly classify all of them. Okay, so we can find these clean examples. Now let's look at the performance, the test accuracy. On CPAR 10, CPAR 100, we have 20, 50, 80% symmetric noise. And 20, 50, and I don't see the right side of my screen, and some asymmetric noise. So, and you can see that we could beat all of the state-of-the-art baselines with this method, and we get up to 6% improvement, in particular under 80% noise, which is like a lot of noise. And finally, on a real noisy labeled data set, mini web vision, again, we could beat all these baselines, in, uh, we got 5% improvement in average. So I also talked about noisy labels. I'm hoping that I could show you the same set of examples can provide both efficiency and robustness. And hopefully if we are a little bit more selective about the data points that we train on, we can do better in machine learning. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Baran. Uh, that, that was a really great talk. Um, so before I uh, stop your screen share, I wanted to pass along one uh, clarification question from the audience. Um, so let's see, it says in the figure on slide 20, where you had some uh, blue cl clusters with a few centroids and a few red clusters with a couple centroids. Um, so Matthias in the audience was just uh, wondering how we should kind of read those different um, uh, centroids. Uh, so just wanted to, you know, let you jump back to slide 20 uh, and, uh, and answer that real quick. Um, specifically, are there five unique clusters represented with just two colors um, or are there two different clusters? I guess... Uh, Right, so these blue centroids I have and these red centroids, how how should um, how should we we interpret them? Um, and I guess also, how do you decide how many centroids that you, that you want That's or metroids? I guess. Okay, so the two questions are I think closely related to each other. So the thing is, you either have a fixed budget for training. You you say that okay, I have this much time, or I can afford to train on ten percent of this subset. And then you are going to select 
10%, a subset of size 10%, and then you will get some cluster centers. You get more from the larger classes. This is an imbalanced data set in this picture. And you get less probably from smaller classes, but you make sure that you cover all the classes. So this is one scenario. The other scenario is that the, if you look at the, this problem for uh, not this one, but the, this, this formulation that I started with. One second. So I said that we want to, the difference between the gradient of the full data, this equation, the difference between the gradient of the full data and the weighted gradient of the subset to be less than epsilon. So what we do in practice, and I kind of skip this detail for the sake of time, is that we can select as many. If you look at the left side of this equation, this means that the smallest subset that satisfies this equation on the right. If you the left side says that, let's find the smallest subset part mean of the cardinality of this. Let's find the smallest subset that satisfies this upper bound on the right. So you can, in practice, select as many as your upper bound is satisfied, right? So this is called the submodular cover problem. This is the dual to submodular maximization. I skip this part, but you can do both. You can either select until this condition is satisfied, and then you make sure that the upper bound always is less than epsilon, or you can say that I have a fixed budget, I select 10%, and I will get the corresponding epsilon for it. Gotcha. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, I guess now now we'll kind of move on into uh, more general questions. Um, so I, I also just saw this one uh, come in um, from the audience, but it was one I was thinking about too. Um, so so for me, whenever I look at kind of the noisy label literature, um, uh, I first I, I love your work that that you can kind of put some guarantees on these uh, general trends that people in noisy label literature have noticed about kind of when you start um, kind of memorizing or overfitting to the noisy labels. Um, one of the things I always wonder is that uh, it seems like the exact same properties that you can use to identify noisy labels would be the exact same properties of uh, like very rare examples or very rare subclasses. Um, someone in the chat. Um, talks about like outliers or um, like, you know, rare subgroups. Um, I wonder, how do you think about that? Because um, yeah, it was kind of one of the motivating examples, like maybe a bike in the middle of the road is a super rare example you care about, but maybe it's just a mislabeled example. Yeah. Um, so how, how do you kind that's of think a, about that that's tension? That's a very good question. That's a very good question. So actually, we are not selecting outliers. So the reason is that if you think about this, um, do you still see me? Uh, no, I just turned off your screen share. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Sounds great. So let me, okay. So if we look at this exemplar clustering objective, so this is going to use the L2 norm of the distance, right? The Euclidean distance between gradients of I and J. And this is the K-medoid problem. If you compare it with K-means, K-medoid has, provides, it serves some robustness against outliers. It's not going to select outliers for you. So this is one reason that we don't select outliers. The second reason that we don't select outliers is that these methods are the central elements. So, and if you have some outliers that is not close to anything in the gradient space, so that is not getting selected. So we are not selecting outliers in general, but if you have an outlier cluster, Outlier, small outlier cluster, then you are you may, if you go with larger subset, you are you may select that center. And then the question becomes: do we have outlier clusters or do we have important clusters that are underrepresented? Right? Mm -hmm. This is one thing. And hopefully, if you have a cluster that is going to be unrepresented data points, outliers shouldn't be very similar to each other, probably. But another thing is that. Uh, if I have a few more minutes, I can explain this. Yeah. So we are capturing the gradient, right? We are we are selecting subset that captures the gradient. And let's uh, think of, let's say a neural network. Let's say that we are training a neural network. And at different points in time, we are selecting subset that captures the gradient. So early in the training, what happens is that most of the gradients are large for easy examples and for more difficult examples. So most of the gradients are large and we are going to select 
a lot of easy examples because they are bigger clusters of gradients. They have a slightly smaller gradient and the most difficult ones has larger gradients and they kind of are smaller clusters. So we are selecting a lot of easy examples in the beginning and some more difficult ones as well. But as the as training proceeds, so most of the easy examples we can classify very well. And then the gradients for those easy examples becomes very close to zero, right? So after some point in time, we are not going to select any easy examples anymore, just a few, because they become very large gradient clusters close to zero, the gradient close to zero. And then we start to focus on the more difficult examples. And then we keep selecting them. And if you keep training and training and training, then you may, you may overfit. But this is the same behavior as will happen if you train on the entire data set as well. Right. So capturing these gradients give you similar properties as training on the entire data. So we can do early stopping to prevent the network to memorize those points if we feel that we have some outliers. And for the noisy ones, I think I explained that we are most probably not going to select bad data points, noisy labeled data points. So, but if we know that, for example, if we have the class labels, which we have in the supervised learning scenario, then we can select more examples from the smaller classes now because we have a control on that. We can select more centers from there, less centers from larger classes. So it gives us a little bit more control. Gotcha, thanks so much. Actually, Varani, I have a follow-up um, follow on, on this, which is um, from the different um, cases that you showed us, uh, it seems like you know you can almost always find a certain percentage of, of of the data that ended up working really well, right? But you know, in order to figure out what that percentage is, in your case, you can run like multiple experiments for doing that. But in a real world scenario, it can uh, one would need to know that number beforehand to be able to actually obtain the advantage, right? Yeah. So is there like a heuristic or a rule of thumb or or anything that's else? A, that's a very good question. So the thing is that for for the convex case, you usually need a small size subsets and you can stick with selecting as many as your upper bound is satisfied, that epsilon is satisfied and that you can directly optimize for it because you are working with only feature vectors. So the downside is that because that's an upper bound, you are going to select a larger subset than, than is necessary, right? So you usually, if you really want that epsilon to be satisfied, then you are selecting more elements that we actually need in practice. But in practice, I think we are usually bounded by some restriction, either on time or something like GPU. So then the first case happens that you say that I can afford to train on this many elements and then I get some epsilon for it, some error for it. But so you can optimize for epsilon directly, or you can optimize for the number, cardinality of the subset, and either you get an epsilon or you get a cardinality corresponding to it. I think one thing that would be super interesting for me to, to see is something like, you know, in the plot, you were showing that, you know, you end training either substantially earlier, either in terms of time or either in terms of epochs. It would be really nice to see the same thing plus the time that it takes for figuring out the subset. And it how does, big the it, it included at that time, actually. Oh, it's also included. Yeah, yeah. 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 That, that's, that, that, that's great. Yeah. That, and, and it would be nice to see, like, yeah, yeah. Um, that helps a lot understanding, like, the, the, the trade off. Yeah, so, the, for the convex control. functions, it was really helping a lot for neural networks. There are still a lot of things to do over this idea mm -hmm. because yeah. the reason is that the gradient changes very rapidly. Right. So either you have to select a small subset to be able to catch up with the gradient, or you have to kind of be smarter. Actually, the, there's an interesting segue on, on, on this specifically, because I was curious, you know, at the beginning, you explained the fact that you could use basically just the inputs to the last layer yes. uh, instead of the, 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 the gradients of yes. all the rest of the network in order to figure out the, yes. the subset. But you also said that, you know, that um, um, subset needs to be anyway updated a certain yeah. moment in time. So I was curious, if, is there a trade-off there like um, between how often you update a subset and how expensive is that um, operation of dating the Definitely. subset? Definitely. So first of all, you mentioned a good point. So these gradient approximations that we use, these are kind of heuristic, right? There is no guarantee that there is an upper bound between the difference of last layer gradient and the actual gradient. So this is one thing that 
So I was talking, when I talked to different people, some people like in particular in vision say that, oh, this layer is more important for this task or that layer is more important for that task. So probably that is a better choice as a gradient mm -hmm. approximation. Like this is kind of a, this is something that needs more thought, I guess. <laughs> And then updating as well, you mentioned a very good point. So for neural networks, the speed up is less. So we are not going to get 10 times the speed up because we have to update this subset. And I believe because the gradients change rapidly, this subset that we find, let's say at the beginning of the epoch may not very well capture the gradient after a few mini batches in particular in the first five, 10 epochs, right? So there probably we need to update the subset much more frequently in the beginning. And then afterwards the landscape becomes smoother and we kind of get into a convex shape landscape and we don't need to update the subset at all. Mm -hmm. And there's a, we didn't do any of this. So we are working on it right now in the group. Yeah. But these are all very good questions. <laughs> very interesting. So this conversation reminds me of like the mechanism that Adaboost uses for then basically defining the subsets of data to, to work on. So I don't know if there's a, mm -hmm. some hidden connection with that because, you know, it's um, um, the, the way I, you know, imagine it to happen is that uh, also I can imagine that if you plot over time, the subset of data points that you um, so select, I can imagine it will somehow converge to a certain group after yeah. a while. And so maybe there is a threshold that you can say, okay, now I, I think I'm converged. Yeah. I will keep using these data points moving forward okay. or something, like, an optimization like that, that you could imagine doing, yes. right? Yes, definitely. That's, that's super interesting. Yeah. Thank you very much for your answer. Thank you for the great questions. <laughs> Bahran, uh, one of the things I was wondering, um, you know, because you you motivated your the original talk by talking about things like GPT three and um, all the uh, all the compute and carbon you know footprint that that training that model um, cost. Uh, I wonder if you try to apply your techniques to a different setting, like not a supervised um, not not a supervised learning setting where the losses look different, where the objectives look different, where I don't think we have as good of an intuition about what these models are even learning. Um, how do you think your techniques would change or the analysis or, or the intuition about what you're trying to do? So if we don't have the label, like if we don't have all the labels, we are and we are in the semi-supervised scenario, you can apply the same idea to the predicted labels. So that is mm -hmm. one thing that I have seen people are doing not exactly the same technique, but the same idea. Like people use the predictions like as the labels, and then they try to find the most important examples for active learning a lot of times. So I believe the same idea can be applied here. You can, you have a few examples, you can use them, train for a few epochs, you can use the predictions to kind of label the rest of the data point, and then you get the gradients using that predicted labels. So this is one idea for the, uh, semi-supervised scenario, but for these non-convex models that we are not, we don't know what is happening really. So I think this is going back to the previous discussion that this subset, like it really matters how frequently you are updating them. And after a while, you really don't need to update them. And this is something we really don't uh, look at it closely in the paper, but it would be very interesting to see because most of the change in the kernel, the neural network happens, people have shown that happens very early, like 10 epochs, maximum 30 epochs, a lot of times for big resnets. So I don't know exactly what is happening to GPT-3, how long is that phase, but that is the most important phase that either we can improve these techniques, I believe we should improve these techniques for these non-convex landscapes, and there are ways to do that, hopefully. But after some time, and after some time, as um, Piero mentioned, we really don't need to. We can stick with one thing, and we can stick to that, and we don't need to bother ourselves. I think that, so we really don't need to know much about the landscape or the network or the properties of, like we can think of a black box model, but we kind of know that earlier we should be more careful. And we should, we need improvements there, I believe. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, Baharan, I was hoping you could talk a little bit about um, some of the properties you've noticed in large data sets. 
Um, one question I had is, are you aware of any large data sets which, where we wouldn't have you know, clusters appear? So, so if we are talking about, so it depends on what kind of data sets. If you are talking about large data sets like ImageNet, which are benchmark data sets, these are really manually collected. So things are balanced and things are not really redundant, right? So we cannot really take out a lot of examples and say that we are fine with 30% of this. I don't think that is gonna work. But if we are thinking of real, real, for example, self-driving data, there are lots of redundant examples here that we can easily get rid of. And we are not going to harm any accuracy, I guess. So we are trying to actually try one of these ideas on one of this Waymo, for example, open data set or one of these open, like a lot of recently, a lot of these self-driving companies released some of their data to see what exactly happening on real raw data set that have a lot of redundancies. But the other uh, point that I can mention is that, so the more structured, the more structure is in your data set, you can stick with fewer data points, right? Like the more clusterable and the more your data set, the more it makes sense. <laughs> Basically, you can do more with it. If you can, if you think of a uniformly distributed data set which doesn't have any pattern to it, you probably need to train on everything, right? Because there is no redundancy, like things are like you cannot do much. So these techniques, I believe, are more useful when we have structures. And I think most of the real data sets that I can think of have some structure to them. So they may have a smaller and larger clusters but they have some kind of a structure as far as I can think of. That makes a lot of sense, thanks. I think we're uh, approaching the, the end of the hour for, for YouTube at least. Um, so I wanted to kind of you know give you a chance to uh, maybe speculate about kind of uh, what's coming next in this field um, or, or what, what you'll need to do to, to get some of these um, you know, GPD sized models um, uh, you know, training more realistically without, uh, I think, driving to the moon twice, <laughs> there, there and back <laughs> twice. Um, so I just, you know, from your perspective as, you know, someone who's kind of at the forefront of these things, what do you think will be necessary to make these, you know, exciting fancies kind of more realistic for people to, to use them? What is, you know, in general, kind of what's next to, to make, um, to make these techniques more usable and, uh, more accessible to everybody? So that's a difficult question, of course, because we don't know what is going to happen soon. But there are like something that I think in general we should be careful about is that currently we are scaling and scaling and scaling. Like in two years, I'm sure we get something twice as big as GPT-3. And of course, some companies can afford to do it, but this is not something we can do every day, right? And ideally, we want to kind of be able to learn so fast that we can react in real time. And the other thing that I think is important is that, so we have one brain that can take care of different tasks. So we don't have like 120 billion parameters to only speak. And we don't have another 5 billion <laughs> parameters to kind of classify images, right? So, and if we want to have something that eventually is like our brain, one model that can take care of different things, which is I think the goal somehow, then we really need to be able to make some sense out of these huge models. We may we need to kind of compress them and find something that is sm smaller and but has more functionalities, right? And I think people are like have started to work on this. Like we have neural network compression, neural architecture search. I think this is something that definitely we need to do. At the same time, we should as well be selective with the data. Like if you think of a child, you are not going to show him all different examples of dogs <laughs> for him to learn, right? You show him two dogs and he can very well find the rest. So probably if we can train on better, more representative examples, and we can a little bit make more sense out of these huge models that we are working with that will help us get closer to that having a single model that can take care of different tasks and get closer to what that goal. So I'm hoping <laughs> we do this. 
Yeah. Definitely don't want kids learning how to talk from Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, thanks so much for for that great answer. Um, so with that, I th I think we'll we'll call it on the YouTube portion. So thank you, Bahran, for for a great talk. We we really enjoyed it and, and learned a lot. Um, thanks to the YouTube audience. Um, uh, so thank you to to those of you who were there during the pre-show and gave me advice about how to fix my knees. And thanks to you know everyone who's in the chat afterwards. Um, I saw there was quite a lovely discussion, uh, lively discussion, which we always love to see. Um, as always, you can go to our website, mlsys.sanford.edu to uh, look at our schedule and uh, hear more about our seminar series. We've got a mailing list, which you can subscribe to. I think we send, you know, two emails a week. Um, so no spam, we promise. Um, if you're watching on YouTube, be sure to subscribe, uh, hit the bell icon, um, like the video and come back uh, every week. Uh, next week, we'll be back same time, same place. Uh, this time we've got Albert Gu. He'll be talking about structured, uh, structured state space models. Lots of S's, something like that. Uh, it's a really cool um, new technique in sequence modeling. Um, so yeah, uh, looking forward to seeing everyone then. And with that, we'll say goodbye to YouTube. <laughs>